Yeah. But you know why? That's why I'm going to go back out to the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church. We, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth, and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, we, um, we have looked at the Lauren Schultz's. So far, we have been through the uh, invocation, the uh, you know, as a part of the preparation, confession and absolution. Uh, then we looked at the introit and the uh, the introit as well, and then we moved to the curiae uh, and then to the gloria and excelsis. Uh, now we are going to some of these things will actually. Now that we're past those, um, with this will move a little faster. Uh, today we, we look to the salutation and the collect of the day. And this isn't going to take very long at all. Okay. Um, uh, well, actually, I can make anything. Yeah, I can make anything. It's not supposed to take a very long. I can make it take forever. So let's uh, let's uh, yeah. So I take that back. Um, at this point in the service, uh, we have thoroughly recognized Christ's presence among us. And so then at this point, the pastor, after the uh, singing of the Gloria and Excelsis, turns around to the congregation and says, with body language as well as language, the Lord be with you. Okay? Alright? I do that. Now in the pew, in the pew, you can do this. As if you're receiving that from the pastor. And then the pastor says, the Lord be with you, and then you who have received that, then you can actually say, you can do, and also with, no, and with thy spirit. You can actually do the same hand motion. You can do that. You can you can do that. This is why sometimes it's, if you have the liturgy memorized, you can actually get yourself into it a little bit more. So you can actually, when I say the Lord be with you, you can receive it as if it's coming into your head okay the blessing because when when you are up when you, when you're up at the altar okay the blessing for the communicant is what receiving the body and blood okay but for any who are not receiving how do they receive a blessing Sort of. Now I'm dealing with like, body language here. What happens? You're paying attention up there. You're watching. Well, they're getting blessed over their head. Yeah. Over yeah. And it's not a holy hover. Okay? It's not the holy hover. Actually okay? Touching. Actually touching. Now I, do, I try not to put touch these three fingers to their head. But the palm and the other couple fingers will end up on their on their head. Why not these three fingers? You got a mark on the No. So you get the host. Because I don't want because <laughs> some people might not want me touching the host mm -hmm. and then touching somebody's oily scalp. Okay? So I don't touch, this is just for you. If I'm giving someone a blessing, these three fingers that I touch the host with. Do not touch their head, the palm, and maybe these couple of fingers, like this. Okay. Um, 
it has to do with imparting a blessing. That there's actually, you know, that the pastor is putting this blessing on your head. And so if the pastor is saying, the Lord be with you from the altar, and I'm doing the hand motion this way, it's, it's an appropriate thing to bow, and then with, with, with kind of like an open hands like this, receive the blessing. And then if you, when you say, and with thy spirit, then you can say, you can give that back the same way that the pastor with his hand motion did that. There's, there's, a, it, there, there's something natural about it. Okay, so... Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to do it. You don't. But it is it is something that you can do um, if you are so moved. Um, for the salutation, um, they want to think about where that word. What's that word sound like? It's a hello. It's a hello. Okay. What else? A salute. Okay. This is yeah. It's it's a hello. It's a salute. It's a it's a it's a greeting. Okay, so that's what's happening. Here. This is taken from Second Timothy four twenty two. Not at the beginning of the book, but at the end of the book, where Saint Timothy. We don't even have to turn to it because you you just don't have to because it's it's just one verse where where he tells T Timothy at the end, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. So that, that is where the, the salutation is derived from, is from, from the end of 2 Timothy, okay, as a greeting. Now the collect of the day, what, is, what do you think that means? What is that all about? What, what is the collect? Any ideas? I think of collect when I read. Yeah, you think of collect. Well, well what are we, what, what's the pastor or the church trying to collect? Okay. I'm, I'm, what I need to do is I need to collect your thoughts, and we need to gather all of your thoughts together. And what the pastor is about to pray, we are all going to pray together. And typically, the collect of the day, of the day part, means that this particular prayer is for that particular day, and it's going to. There's going to be something about it that's going to f try to focus us, okay, to collect our thoughts, focus us in on what we're about to hear. Because the pastor prays at the altar this prayer, and then what am I immediately going to then, after the prayer is over, go and do? Amen. What? Say amen. <laughs> okay, amen, and then what? I'm going to start walking somewhere. And we start the readings. I walk to the lectern. Yeah. The collect of the day is to collect our thoughts so that we can, with that prayer, properly focus upon what we are about to hear. Because every Sunday, and this is something that's been lost on, our, on many people today in the church, with the encroachment of, of the, the, with the encroachment of the very idea of casual worship, okay? Now we certainly, because of our culture, we, we, we certainly have become more casual in our, our dress when we go to church, correct? Mm -hmm. We have. When you, back, back, way back in the day, what did people always wear to church? Women wore dresses. Wore you suits. wore dresses, you wore suits, you wore a jacket, you know, that's what you wore. You wore your Sunday, you wore your Sunday best, is what you wore. Okay? Um, now, now that's kind of fallen away. And what do we tell people when they visit? Well, I don't have any really nice clothes to wear. What do you say? We don't care. Just come. Just come. All right? So, um, what was that? God doesn't care what you're wearing. Right. He wants you there. Now, is there is there something to, you know, getting dressed up so you can go to church? I feel like if I get the chance to dress up to come to church, it's, I'm not showing off anything. I'm just, this is, I'm, I'm approaching the king, the God of the universe. And it shows, I, for me, 
it makes me feel that I'm respecting him a little bit more right. by taking, getting up earlier and taking more time out of my morning to get ready for, for him. Yeah. You know. It's kind of like this, um, and I don't want to dwell on this too long. If you are going to meet with, you know, say, you know, the President of the United States, okay, or the Queen of England, or somebody who has a regal stature and is a very important political figure, you know, you're, you're probably, especially, like, say, let me give you the best example. If you're invited to a royal wedding, what are you going to wear? You are going to wear your very best clothing. You might go out and buy something specific for that event. And that, I think, is really what people did for Sunday. That's why it was called your Sunday best. Because you would have a specific set of clothes or two that would be set aside so that you could wear that on, on Sunday. Because you're not, this per, the person that you're going to meet with is not the the king or the queen of England. It's the, it's the God of heaven. It's the king of kings and lord of lords. So that's where the Sunday best and all of that came in. Now the, the uh, casual nature of, it's just our culture has just been just driven just to this total casualness about everything. Um, I bring this up because it's so, if, if a church is, most churches today, I'll tell you, to find one that is, 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 is conservative and is going to be um, staunchly liturgical is becoming, um, becoming a rarity, even among congregations that still, you know, have um, beautiful traditional architecture. Um, you, you, you end up with these um, circumstances where, like, uh, what is the name of this? St. Saint Lawrence. Um, there's a church up in Frankenmuth, up in that area. One of the founding churches of our synod. Um, and uh, they have this beautiful sanctuary. Supposedly it holds like 2,500 people. Okay, long, long church. Beautiful stained glass windows. This place is been practically... If you wanted to describe a Lutheran cathedral in America, this would be pretty, pretty close to that. Um, but when I visited, you know, we visited as a as a choir from Fort Wayne, and uh, you know, we were just coming through, and you know, just wanted to say hello, and they have a school and everything. Um, they have almost abandoned their traditional worship space. And guess what? Guess what place? Guess where they worship? Most of their members worship in now. The gym. They worship in the gym. Is where they worship now. That's what a lot of them are looking like now. Yep. Gym. Most sanctuaries look like a gym. You have many, many, uh, many old Lutheran churches. They don't even build a sanctuary anymore. They just have a multi-purpose room, and they just they have a gym, and you've got a stage, and you roll out the altar. And the pulpit, you roll it out. What's the problem with that? An altar is meant to be what? Stable. Stable and it's meant to be fixed, immovable. Okay. Um, and it's this, it, it's just lent itself to this idea of it's just everything is just so casual. Um, you even get it with, you know, the Lord be with you and also with you. That's a minor one. Um, but that one at least. Even today, you can't even get people to say that. You know? Yeah. Some even have their uh, basketball hoops up where they can fold them up to yeah. the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During worship. Yeah, the big non denominational church in Jacksonville, it was in South Jacksonville, actually. Um, my predecessor um, believed That's that Salem had to become that. like them. Abiding and Savior does. What was it? I think Abiding Savior Lutheran Church does that. Where's Abiding Savior? South County. Yeah. And, and, and this is this has been taught in our seminary. Um, I'll say seminary, one of them. Um, and just this casual, do whatever it takes to get people to join. Um, this idea of meet people where they are. Um, yeah, you meet people where they are, but 
you, you also have to bring them into the church. Uh, the church, the church is not to mirror the culture. The church is to change the culture, and um, unfortunately, we've we've done that. We've been changed by the culture far too much. Um, no, it, it's I bring this I bring this up because of what's of what's happening in the worship service. Now, give you an example of how I'm going to make this longer than it needs to be. Okay. There are three places in the worship service where the pastor turns around and says, the Lord be with you. Three times. This is the first one. When is the second one? What? Towards the end. Towards the end. Right at the end. Right? Right, mm-hmm. right before I give the the benediction. Where's the second time? That's the third. Where's the second time? Right before communion. What? Right before communion. Right before communion. Okay. Um, which direction am I facing when I say, the Lord be with you? Towards the congregation. I'm facing the congregation. And I say, the Lord be with you. And then you say, and with thy spirit. Why? What? We're blessing you. There's, there, in a way, there is. There's a little bit of a blessing and a response of grace that's happening there. This happens because I'm about to do something big. <coughs> big. Okay. Because when the pastor says, the Lord be with you, and you say, and with thy spirit, what this means is the pastor is about to turn around and do something in the <coughs> service that is priestly. Okay. Roman Lutherans don't like that word, but um, in the Augsburg Confession, you can call your pastor a priest. It's not some kind of horrible thing to think of your pastor as a priest. After all, it's the strange irony in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, is that Walther, I mean L- Luther, coined, coined the idea of the priesthood of all believers based upon what Peter says and Moses says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy people, okay, set aside to do works for God, okay, and all that. Um, and Peter, Peter quotes Moses from Exodus. And so on the basis of that, Luther says that we are a royal, royal priesthood of all believers. So the grand irony in all of it is that Lutherans love to call themselves priests, but the only person in the congregation who doesn't dare call himself a priest is the pastor. <laughs> but your pastor, your pastor is a priest. And the reason why this is it says in the Augsburg Confession that our priests get married. That's what it says. It even uses, it uses that language. Our priests take wives. So, um, yeah. So it's not a wrong thing to think of your pastor as a priest. So your pastor is going to turn around and do something priestly. And you say, and with thy spirit, because if he's going to turn around and do something really important and priestly and address Christ, he needs the spirit. Yeah, the spirit that the Lord needs to be with your pastor in that moment. Okay? Because what is about to be handled from this point forward? I'm going to walk over there and then I'm going to read. Okay? I'm going to read. Three lessons, sometimes two. On Sunday, it's three. Can be two. On Wednesday, it's only two. So, we're going to collect our thoughts. I'm going to go read, or maybe there'll be a reader to read the first two. And then what's going to happen? The sermon. The sermon's going to happen. So what is going to happen from this point on? You better, you better want the Lord to be with your pastor. So that what he says will be a benefit to you. And that he will not be influenced by his own pride or a temptation of the devil to preach and teach something to you that is false. Okay? All right. So the collect of the day, typically it's a short prayer. It gathers what the readings are going to be about. Um, like today, is you have instituted the ministry of, or the, the order of men and angels... Okay, and so what are the readings about? The readings are about angels, and the readings in the, the gospel lesson it's about the ministry of the seventy-two messengers. So, the collect has something to do with the readings. 
all right? So then the pastor walks over to the lectern, and uh, he will do the Old Testament or the first reading, okay? Um, today we had uh, the, um, the first reading was an Old Testament lesson, okay? I could have called the passage from Revelation. I think I called it the epistle lesson. I think I did. It should have been called that. It should have been called the, the second reading, okay? Did I commit a mortal sin? No. No, it's whatever. It, it's the same spot. Uh, and then uh, after we, we've read the, like, traditionally speaking in the Lutheran church, there are only two readings. There's only the epistle lesson, or the sec, or the, it, which would be the first reading, and then the gospel lesson. It was in the 20th century that the Lutheran church picked up on this tradition of having an Old Testament lesson um, from the pattern of worship that, at least this is the way it was explained to me, the pattern of worship in a Lutheran parish in Germany. There was a list of Old Testament lessons for every Sunday. And the Old Testament lesson would be read at matins. And the matins service would be earlier in the morning, like say it's seven or eight. And then the, the divine service would be later in the morning, like at 10 or 10.30, okay, or even nine, somewhere in there, mid-morning to late morning. And that's when the parish would schedule it. And so at the, at the matins service or the morning prayer service, the reading for that, for that service was the was the Old Testament lesson. And so the people would come, the servants and the like, and they would come and hear a lesson, they would hear a sermon, and then they would go home and prepare supper. Now you're probably wondering, well, what about the Lord's Supper for them? Well, then they would, they would receive the Lord's Supper, you know, they would be given the opportunity during the week to receive it. But if they were servants, they would go early, and then everybody else in the, in the, in the community would go later on in the morning. Okay? Okay. Um, now we order these things from Old Testament to Epistle and to Gospel. And we're used to this as Westerners simply because this is the way we've always done it. But we like to build towards something. Okay? We've had a little bit, we've had the Glory and Excelsis. There's kind of this building that happens, we sing the glory of Chelsea, and then the collect of the day happens, and we kind of, it's kind of a thaw, okay? And then we start, then we start reading. The Old Testament, is that the most important one? How, which is the most important reading? No, they are. Which is the most important reading? Gospel. The gospel lesson is. Gospel. The gospel lesson is the most important how do we know that the gospel lesson is the most important? That's what we're ordered to do is go and the No. Yes, but that's not why it's the most important. Why we know it's the most important one. It's God's word. What? We stand up. We stand up because we are about to hear the very words, most often the very words of Jesus Himself, and so we 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 go from. You know, from less less important to you know, and we, we we work ourselves up to the gospel lesson, and then we stand. Now, this is portrayed in the um, liturgically. It can be done this way. If you have a, a lectern, they will read they will read like we do um, the Old Testament lesson from the lectern, okay, and then or you read the epistle from there. And then during, during the gradual and alleluia, the pastor would move either, would move from, from there to, to the altar. You might have seen this at East, on Easter, Easter Sunday. I read the gospel from the altar. We had someone, it was, it was read from the, the Old Testament and the epistle were read from the lectern. And then the gospel was read from the altar. And that, that shows that that's also a level of, of importance. It shows that. And so it, you even can do this thing where you read the Old Testament 
from the lectern, and then you, you can move to one side of the altar, which is called the epistle side, and then you can then move to the gospel side. That can happen. The other thing that can happen there is you can even you can have the gospel procession where you move the um, you you have your, your your cross. Since we've talked about the procession already, the procession can happen at this point where you'll have a gospel procession where the crucifer will take the cross, the um, torch bearers will gra will grab the two uh, candles from the side of the lectern. And then they will lead, and then the gospel will be will go out to the middle of the sanctuary, where the gospel lesson is read right in the middle of the congregation, and everybody faces it. That can be done as well. Um, so, yeah. Uh, as far as what what we what we preach on, um, there's all kinds of different theories of preaching. Um, I know back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, and even, you know, depending on the generation of pastor, um, they'll tell you in the seminary, you can preach on any of the lessons you want. Some of the professors will tell you that. Oh, you can preach on any of them you want. Uh, we were told in seminary, you will preach on the gospel lesson. You will preach on the gospel lesson every Sunday. Why? Why would, why would a professor tell his students, you must preach on the gospel lesson every Sunday? So they'd be up to speed on what they're talking about. Huh? They had to research the gospel so they're more knowledgeable at it. Well, okay, there's that. But, but why would a professor tell, tell, tell you that? Tell, tell a pastor, you must preach on the gospel lesson. Okay, most important. We touched on it already. Your people came to... What, why, why do people go to church? Your God's Word. Your God's Word. Okay, let's get more specific. To worship. You came here to worship who? God. You came here to worship who? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. You came here to hear what Jesus has to say about your life and about about what he's done for you. That's why you're there. That's why I am going to have this made, or a little plaque, stick them on the pulpit, on the desk, right here. Sir, we would see Jesus. Okay? Because that's why your people are there. Your people want to hear about Jesus. That's why they're in the church. That's why they're there. That's why you're here. Uh, otherwise, what can happen is, if you just tell a pastor, well, you can preach on any of the lessons you want, well, you can get, you can get a, a like, local congregation, okay, I will not say who, not that local, nobody that close, but I, I, I watched just a snippet of a sermon from a more liberal congregation in our synod, and the guy was preaching on the Old Testament lesson. Okay? Um, and he was reading about, you know, Genesis, like Genesis 1, or it was what it was. He was preaching on it. And he said in there that the whole point of the book of Genesis is to show us that God puts rhythms in human life. <laughs> There's a rhythm to human life. Is that why God told us that he created everything? He did not write his Bible, and he did not write the book of Genesis through Moses so that we could know from Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 that there is rhythms to human life. That's not why. Okay? Um, the re one of the major reasons why we have to preach on the gospel lesson is What's, what's the problem with the Old Testament? Nothing. It's God's word. Thank you, Lutherans. Okay. But there is something wrong with it. Who preaches on the Old Testament all the time? 
Jews do in their synagogues. You want to go and hear a, a, an Old Testament lesson? You can go to the synagogue. They're not going to preach on Jesus. We need to preach on the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson, if the sermon is about the gospel, that is the climax of the service of the word. It's the pinnacle of it. We stand up, and then we hear the pastor talk about it. Now, what do I do? Do I preach on the gospel lesson? Yeah, I do. But what do I also do? I bring out points from the Old Testament and the epistle because those lessons are not an accident. Those lessons, more often than not, relate to the gospel. And so a pastor, if, he, if he's picked up on this, he can preach on all three lessons with the emphasis on the gospel lesson and the emphasis on Jesus and his death and resurrection. Okay? Okay. Uh, the Old Testament, also, I mean, all of it is pointing the way to Christ anyway. True. Everything about it is right. pointing its way to Christ. Now, in, now if, a, if, a pastor, if a pastor preaches the Old Testament lesson so that he can preach Christ, amen. Okay? Um, if the pastor, you know, can preach the epistle lesson, okay, fine. Many people have been you know, saved because of that. Um, back in the day, many pastors wouldn't preach on the gospel lesson. Which, le which lesson would most LCMS pastors <coughs> preach on? The epistle lesson. Why? No. Because it's easier. It's easier to preach on what Paul says. Because Paul lays everything out so clear. And Paul says what we Lutherans talk about all the time. Justification by grace through faith, not according to works, so no man can boast. Okay, so many times, I mean, I, I was at a circuit meeting way back, like beginning of my ministry, and it was, it was Holy Cross Day, um, and they celebrated it, and, but the pastor there decided not to, he decided to preach on the gospel lesson for the coming Sunday. And it happened to be the, the parable of the wicked servant, okay? The wicked, wicked, wicked servant. And the pastor was, he, he, he said openly in his sermon, I couldn't preach on that one, that was too hard. So I preached on this. And then he says, how many of you guys actually preached on the gospel lesson? And all the young guys raised their hands. All the older guys, they didn't, because... If you can't, if you can't, because that's the problem. Many of these guys, they have not wrestled with Jesus in the gospel lessons. Many of the old-time pastors had really only concentrated on the epistles and then the theology of St. Paul. And they didn't know how to deal with Jesus preaching. Because Jesus preaching is not always, you can't cram it into law first, gospel second. Um, so... The pastors coming out today, right now, at least from Fort Wayne, preach on the gospel lessons. Um, yeah, that's where I'll leave it. So, okay. So I always try to preach on the gospel first and foremost, but I, I weave the other two readings and maybe some other things into my sermon as well. Um, All right, the Alleluia in verse. The gradual, the Alleluia in verse, the way that we do it between the epistle and the, um, the gospel lesson is where that goes. And that is designed to be a, a piece of music that fills the awkward silence. Okay, so imagine we don't do the Alleluia and the verse and the gradual. And you're... You've got, you've got your extra workers. You've got your crucifer, you've got your torch bearers, you've got your book bearer, and you've got the, the, the guy who's going to read, whether it's the assistant pastor or the pastor, and they're gonna, they have to do their walk down into the middle of the people. Imagine if there's, no, if there's nothing to do. What would that be like? Awkward silence. Okay? And so 
the church decides, okay, well, we need to fill this spot while the, while, while the gospel book is being moved to the middle of the congregation. So they, the church puts in the, this, this song of the gradual, the alleluia, and the verse together. And the order, the way that we do this, with the gradual smashed together with the alleluia and the verse, with the alleluia and the alleluia, that is the way that it's written in the TLH altar book. It's written that way in the TLH altar book. It's not written like the way that I used to do it because I didn't know what I was doing because most of the time many, many Lutherans, pastors don't know what they're doing because they weren't taught. And even the ones that were taught, probably some of the stuff they were taught didn't fill in all the blanks. So what we ended up with when we added the Old Testament lesson in, put the Old Testament in, well then what do you got to do? They put the gradual in between the Old Testament and the epistle, and then they put the alleluia and the verse and the alleluia. So you end up with this split up thing that happens, but it's actually supposed to be the way that we're doing it upstairs. And the reason why we do that is if we were to do a gospel procession, then there would be some something going on while the book, while the book moves. You know, one pastor, when I put when I when I put this together, because in many LCMS churches, they, they don't even do the gradual. Many LCMS churches don't even do the the verse. Old TLH congregations, typically, if you're just following the the pew edition, the only thing that you would sing would be the no gradual, no verse, just the triple hallelujah. That's, that's all you would do. That's what we used to do. Yeah, that's what we used to do growing up too. But then lo and behold, you know, you start looking into the books and everything, and it's right there in the TL, the, 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 the Lutheran, you know, um, agenda, you know, the altar book. And I've got one on my shelf right above my computer. I pull it down, and it's right in there. And it tells the pastor on each day what you're supposed to do. But many of the pastors, when TLH came out, they weren't taught what to do. But the nerds at the publishing house, they knew what to do. But our seminaries weren't teaching what the pastors were supposed to do in the liturgy. And so people they just did what was did what was written in the in the pew edition. And so what a, this is a blessing of desktop publishing is that I can actually pull those things out. We've got software that can put all of these things in so that we can bring back the richness of what once was. Problem is LSB um, was put together by, by men who didn't, didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> okay, so you actually have to, like a lot of guys that are like my friends and acquaintances it's, it's been quite a journey over the last 10, 15 years to try to actually put a Lutheran service together the way that it's supposed to be done. Um, and it's, uh, and then you, I keep learning things. I keep learning stuff, you know, and so, yeah. All right, so let's keep going here. We stand up for the gospel lesson. Um, and then after that, um, the pastor moves uh, to, at least this is what I do, uh, if there's a gospel procession, it's at this point during the creed that the pastors and the procession will move, and the creed is supposed to start as they're moving from the sanctuary, the chancel, I mean the nave, up to the chancel. So the creed starts that way. Um, I start the creed when I go to the middle. That's just what I do because of what's make, it's what makes sense here. I've been to a few different churches, and they always invite people to uh, read the, you know, I invite you to read, you know, the Nicene Creed okay. or whatever. You don't do that. You just automatically just start in. And I was just curious. Um, the, reason, the reason why is because it's already on the piece of paper, and uh, everybody in the room, most of the people in the room, they know what to do. There's, there are pastors who will invite and they will speak and they'll do the commentary at every little piece throughout the service. And 
problem with that is I'm not an MC. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not the master of ceremony. I, I'm, I'm a priest who's going to, you know, shepherd the flock by going through this. And if it's, I just don't. Um, I didn't grow up with having a pastor that would, that would do that. And uh, when, when, I, when I did, um, it always seemed odd that they gave a commentary throughout the whole thing. You know, like, we're going to do this now, and we're going to do this now, and we're going to do this now, and it just, okay, it's on the paper, we all got a program, why are you telling me, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and they don't do that, they don't do that in a Roman Catholic church, they don't do that in the Eastern Orthodox Church, we've been here before, we know what's coming, okay, that's, that's, that's why, I guess, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, the teaching on the road, like, let's, 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 you brought that up, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the role of the, the pastor in the ceremony, okay? Why does a pastor wear robes? Sets them apart from others. Okay. It, it set, it sets apart what he, what he's doing. Okay, sometimes there's more than one. That way you can decide which one, you know, is wearing certain things. If you have more than one up there, then you know that this particular person is is the pastor of the church or the priest of the church, and he's the one who's going to be doing the sermon, and the other guy is kind of like this. Okay, all right. Good, 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 good stuff. All right. Um... Okay, let's let's start this way. Why do I wear black? Because you're a sinner. Because I'm a sinner. Why is this white? Because what you speak is what comes from the scriptures. Right. The, the, what will come out of this voice box, which this white piece is covering, should be the holy word of God. Okay? That's why. That's this piece. This is not a vestment. This is just clergy dress. Okay? It's the uniform. Uh... The clergy uniform prior to World War II, I think maybe even World War I, uh, a, a priest would wear, what would the uniform be? White. It would, no. It would be black, but it would be, it would be like a robe. Mm -hmm. It would be, it's, it's what would be called a cassock, okay? Uh, and this would all be incorporated into it. World War II came along, and I think this is from the Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics were like, we cannot have our priests out on the battlefield <coughs> running around in cassocks. So the idea of the clergy, that's when the clergy shirt was invented. The clergy shirt, apart from a cassock, was invented, <coughs> and then with black pants. That's the uniform. This is a modern cassock. Okay? Um, Lutherans do not have a collar that sets us apart. Okay? This one here, um, this would be called a Roman collar, okay? Because it's just this here. Anglicans, some, LC, some LCMS pastors like the Anglican collar, which is like the, the white band all the way around. The problem with those is those are typically plastic. Okay, and what's the problem with plastic around your neck? You get hot. And they'll even, like, they've advertised them, you can buy them now where they've got like breathable holes in the, the inside of the plastic thing on there and it connects. And if you don't get the right size of a collar, it's just the worst. I had one of those. Um, then they've got them where, with the attachable collar and then it looks like this, but then it's like, it uses the plastic thing, but then it like comes up around and some of them are wider and then it shows a little bit on the top. <laughs> this here is the easiest thing in the world, okay? I don't care if it's, a, it's called the Roman style. This is cloth all the way around. 
and this thing, you pop it in, I'm a pastor. <laughs> pop it out, I'm not a pastor, okay? So if I'm going to talk politics, guess what I do? <laughs> pop it out, okay? Okay? It's easy. That's why I like that. So, um, okay, what, what's the next thing that the pastor wears? Now, like, like vestments. What, what does the pastor have to put on next? There's a robe. No. No. Okay, the, the white one, right? That's called an awl. Okay? The awl. And that's what the, your acolytes will wear. Most pastors will wear an awl. The modern awl that we have today um, is more common in Southern Europe than it is in Northern Europe. And the reason for that is because in Southern Europe, they could wear a close, they could wear a thin, a thin alb right over their cassock. Northern Europe, the cassocks, because they didn't have heat and air conditioning, especially in the winter, they didn't have heat like we do today with blowing furnaces. They might have like a wood burning, wood burning thing that would make an attempt at heating the sanctuary. Um, but typically, you'd go to church, and you'd have to keep the pastor, the priest, warm. So in Northern Europe, they would line the cassocks with fur. This is why, like, Luther, who was not a thin man, okay, was not a thin guy, he was a little chubby, okay, when he got older, got married, she fed him well. Um, but even before that, you know, if a man is a little more portly and he's a pastor, you know, the cassock's going to be out there. But this is why sometimes you look at these priests, I mean, the fur wouldn't be, this is like really thick fur that they would put on the inside of these cassocks, and so they would be quite thick. So you couldn't get over that a cat that, like the alb like I wear. So what they developed was this flowing garment that would just kind of rest over it, and that's called a surplus, which is a form of an alb, but it's not. Um, and then you would put over that the chasuble. The, ch the white, what is the, the, you've got a black robed pastor with this thing, and he puts the white over. What's the white, what's the white robe for? Symbolizes that he's what? It's the robe of Christ's righteousness. It represents that he is, you know, a man of God, that type of thing. Um, even then, some would say that's not even a vestment, that's just a uniform, too. The vestments are the ones that match, or at least try to match, at least by color, the stuff that the pastor puts on. Most LCMS members are used to what, what vestment on their pastor? No. The stole, okay? Most LCMS members are used to the stole, right? Just this thing going over. They're used to that. Um, back in the day, prior to the 1950s, many LCMS pastors, they would only wear what would be called a Geneva gown or just like a black robe. And then you'd see like these white preaching bands that would come off. Okay, there's like and then they might wear a tippet, which is like a black stole over the top, which simply represented that they had the authority to preach. I think it's called a tippet. But with the 20th century and the ecumenical movement and interest in the liturgy, um, especially in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, the, the LCMS prior to that, we had all these things. It's just Many times these things would only, they would only have like full vestments in, LC, in Lutheran churches in the cities. Because the people out in the, in the countryside, they were what? A little simpler, a little more pietistic, and they didn't want all the fancy robes, okay? Most of the LCMS, though, came from what area? Most of the LCMS was rural for the longest time. So... But when the 1950s happened, the LCMS, in most places, you'd have the pastor wearing the cassock, and then he'd wear the surplus, 
over that, which is more flowy than what I'm wearing. And then the red stole or the, the colored stole would come out and it would be like a shorter version that would come to about here. And what many, many LCMS Lutherans didn't realize is that shorter stole was shorter because it was supposed to go underneath something. It was supposed to go underneath the chasuble. And the chasuble is the matching colored poncho type garment that is, that's the yoke. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, is what Jesus says. That's the yoke. If you ever put a yoke on an animal, it goes all the way around. And that's what the, ch the chasuble represents the yoke. It's not the stole. The stole represents the authority of the office, meaning this man has been given the authority to preach and administer the sacraments. That's what the stole means. Um, today, there are, only, there are only a few people that actually wear stoles. Who gets to wear stoles today? Pastors. Who else? Okay, professors might wear those. But they, that's more of like a, yeah, maybe. What else? Beauty contestants. That's what that is. That's sash. The sash is a stole. Because what it represents is it's got the name. That they have been given the authority that they are the most beautiful woman in this particular state or city or county or whatever. So pastors wear stoles because stoles represent authority to preach, and, and it shows that they have the office of the ministry. The chasuble is the garment for the divine service or the Lord's Supper, okay? The other garments that you might see, if there's multiple pastors, another one is, is, is a garment that is called the, 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 uh, the dalmatic, or it's called a tunicle, meaning it's shaped, it looks like a tunic, which is another word for a shirt. And it's like a big shirt that matches the chasuble. And then the assistant minister wears that. And that symbolizes that he is the assistant minister in that congregation. Um, the other one that you might see is the, um, is the uh, what do they call that thing? The cope. What's a cope? You guys know what a cope is? It's a cape. It's a big, huge cape. And you'll see these, like, typically worn by a district president um, at an ordination. Or if you've got a big high service and you've got multiple clergy and you've got all this stuff, you might have put that on the preacher. So the celebrant would wear the, 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 the chasuble, the, one of the assisting ministers, or maybe a couple of assisting ministers can wear a, a dalmatic and the tunicle. And then if you've got a guest preacher, they could wear um, a cope. Most congregations do not have this stuff. Why? The cost. It's expensive to have these things. The only way that many pastors and congregations have them now is that there are, there are some seamstresses out there who, who sell entire sets and they don't make a lot of money off of them. There's one, there's one particular lady, she lives, I think, in Nebraska, and she makes them for a bunch of congregations. And then there's a place out of India. Lots of LCMS pastors get their vestments from, from this place in India, and they don't okay. And they're okay. I'll just say they're okay. Um, um, and I, I jokingly call them Indian sweatshop vestments, is what I call them, because <laughs> that's really what's happening there. Um, if you buy high quality stuff from CM Alney or from the Holy Root Guild or from some of these uh, other places, they are quite expensive. They are. Um, so a stole from the Holy Root Guild, Holy Root Guild can cost three hundred dollars just for a stole. Um, chasubles with the fabrics that they import from Europe can cost anywhere from a thousand, like eight hundred dollars on the low end, up to like three thousand dollars. So these things are they are not cheap, and so many congregations can't afford them. Um, and Typically, what will happen, too, is um, a pastor will come out of seminary, and there's no guarantee that the congregation is going to have stoles, okay? And you guys have a lot, but there's no guarantee they're going to have them. Um, and if they do, they might be what? They might be worn out. 
And so it's become the thing in the Missouri Synod for pastors to supply their own stoles. Okay? And it, it's not supposed to be that way. Um, the congregation should be the one that's, that supplies those. Now, all I have my own. It's just the way it is. And I like the stuff that I have. Um, but congregations should have these things. But it does, it does cost, it's not cheap. So, um, you know. But they do, all of this stuff, it's ceremonial. Again, do we need to have any of that stuff? No, we don't have, we don't, we don't have to have it. Uh, there's no sin for not having it. Um, but, we, but we as Lutherans consider ourselves to be the heirs of the Western Catholic Church um, that are protesting against the Pope and his false teachings. And so it says in our confessions that we do not abolish the Mass, but we retain it and we celebrate it with more reverence than our opponents. So we, we maintain liturgical traditional worship as part of our confessions. Um, so, all right. Nicene Creed and Apostles' Creed. This is where we'll stop, um, but I'm going to mention this. The uh, Nicene Creed is said when there's communion. The Apostles' Creed, should there always be communion on Sunday morning? Yes. So this is... The Apostles' Creed on Sunday morning should not be an option, okay? Should not be an option in here. Um, Nicene Creed is the communion creed. Back in the day, or you'll see this in some, uh, some Lutheran churches and most um, uh, Catholic churches and uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, it says we believe. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. It says we, we, we. That is actually the proper translation. Um, LCMS Lutherans, for some reason in the 20th century, um, due to proclivities and ex, you know, idiosyncratic nature that the, the sometimes were odd, um, there were some LCMS theologians who were like, no man can make a confession for another. Okay? So... They would actually made an argument that we shouldn't say we, even though, even though we, use, we, we put in our confessions that the Nicene Creed is our confession. So they were actually teaching against that. Um, so it's some, for some reason, it ended up in our books that we say, I believe, in the Nicene Creed. Now, I make the argument that, OK, we don't say we. But if all of us together are saying I, what does that mean? It means we. Should we say we? We probably should. Um, but it's not what we've been doing for 60 years. So until somebody is brave enough to produce a hymnal and make the change, um, we're going to continue to do it the way that we do. Um, the Apostles' Creed is not set during the divine service because it is the, in, it's the individualistic creed. It's the baptismal creed. It's the creed that is said during um, baptism. It's the creed that you should say every day. Um, the Nicene Creed is the creed that we all say together when we go, when we're about to go to the Lord's Supper. It's actually the we part is attached to closed communion, really. It, 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 that's what it has to do with. It has to do with the fact that Prior to, in the old days, prior to saying the creed, that's when they would kick everybody out. Okay? <laughs> if, you, if you were not going to be communing, they would go and they would say, the, the priest or the assisting pastor or whoever would say, the doors, the doors. <laughs> they would. They'd say, the doors, the doors. And that was when the doors were supposed to be shut. And the ushers would go and get the visitors and anyone who was, you know, under church discipline. And they would say, okay, it's time to go. And they wouldn't let the visitors and anybody sit and celebrate the, the Lord's Supper in the room. So that's, so people are upset that we don't give people communion. I mean, in our context, you imagine how upset they would be if we actually, you know, set the doors, the doors, and had the ushers go up and tap and say, okay, you know, with the, the uh, public, the public portion of our worship service is over. Now this is private, and this is only for the family. People might get really upset about that. So, all right, okay. Let us pray. 
Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, that as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you sent it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.